to work with him. So I didn't know what autism was, but I knew the student was different. And I think that just really made me curious um, about his differences and wanting to get to know him. And fortunately, that teacher really took the time to explain what autism was to me and would let me work with them sometimes. And I just really got to know this student um, and, you know, develop a relationship with a student or with a peer who had a disability. And I think that just really kind of sparked my interest in working with people with disabilities um, and ultimately led me to a career in the field of special education. So if you're just joining us, uh, Amber just explained her, you know, her reason and for coming into uh, working with those with autism and, and those with special needs. And uh, again, we're excited to have her here with us. Um, so Amber, when you, you talk about this as, you know, going into the field, so um, if you can briefly just share with everyone um, how your next step, so in regards to you being an intern here with us, but then how that kind of coincidentally, ironically transferred over to then you in your special education teacher role. Yeah, so when I was in college, I got my undergrad in special education, and through that process, it really just kind of opened my eyes to the field, and what was really important to me was, you know, quality of life and, you know, being an advocate, an advocate for, you know, those who may not be able to advocate for themselves, and so I knew I still wanted to be in this field, but I didn't know if I necessarily wanted to teach um, and be in the schools for my entire career. Um, and so I got connected with, with you, with Exercise Connection, started this internship and loved, you know, this different stream of still working with people with disabilities, but outside of the school. Um, I was, got a full-time teaching job as a special education teacher, um, teaching fourth through sixth grade um, in a school um, in, out in a suburb of Chicago. And I loved that experience. I really, you know, that's where I really got my boots on the ground, got a lot of experience working with students of a variety of, you know, different, different levels um, and just, but still wanted to work outside of the schools. And when a full-time opportunity came here with Exercise Connection and Exercise Buddy, you know, I was really excited to see where that would take me and just kind of the bigger picture of being able to work with individuals still, but also, you know, working, creating programs and tools that can reach a wider community. So, so I know as a special education teacher, one of the things that we've been promoting you is in coming on is that you were challenged with something that maybe other special education teachers now um, specifically due to COVID-19, and, and we know many changes are going to happening every minute within the special education in which our school systems. But one of the things, if you can share what you were challenged with as a special education teacher um, and what you did to meet those challenges. Yeah, so as a special education teacher, I think one of um, the biggest challenges was, um, you know, just having all of these students with all of these different needs and not always having, you know, the time or the resources um, to apply your best practices that, you know, you come with. And so that would, you know, make me have to get creative in the strategies we were using um, to support our students' needs. So, for example, my district was really unique in the fact that we as teachers, as academic teachers, were required to teach 10 minutes of physical activity in our instructional day. And, um, you know, that was a little confusing. How were we going to do that? Um, luckily, you know, with my background with Exercise Connection, I had some tools and I was excited about bringing exercise to my students and using it in strategic ways to support some of those challenges that we had. Yeah, and I think I want you to expand on that for everyone listening. <clears throat> um, but I think it's 
you know, it's not just about the tools. I think what you had that was unique is you had years of experience, right? Working directly, um, learning from me and the, the other team members um, of implementing protocols. And I think what I find for not only special education professionals, but also for parents, um, is that sometimes exercise can be quite intimidating um, for people to teach. And one thing that I think that we do or you do um, is we try to obviously create the tools, but create the, the training and the education so, you're, so people aren't intimidated and know mm -hmm. that you don't have to be an ex exercise expert, but there are, the, like you were saying, those evidence-based practices that we need you know, to follow, both as parents or professionals. So what did you do to create these routines to help your students? And how did that, and how, what did that look like? So I had a co-teacher um, all of my years of teaching and the, this co-teacher, you know, didn't have any background in exercise. And so what we did is we sat down together. I showed her some of the tools I had, you know, just the visual exercises, um, start finish boards. And we strategically thought, you know, how could we embed exercise into our day? And, you know, we know that kids love to move and we, we looked at our schedule and we thought, when did we think that our students needed a break? You know, some years it was during our, after our reading block where the kids had to just sit and focus, you know, for over an hour at a time, we knew that they would need movement. And so that's when we would structure our exercise time or physical activity time into our lesson plans. We would actually, you know, embed it into our lesson plans so that it kept us as teachers accountable. It knew, um, the students knew when to expect this activity just like they did with every other subject throughout their day. So we, uh, we, we treated it the same as we would with, you know, our reading time, our math time, our writing time. It was structured into our day. Yeah, so again, for people just joining us, uh, Amber Panaleo here explaining her experience as a special education teacher being required to add exercise as a part of her students' classroom activities. And I think following up on what you just said, I think if you guys follow Exercise Connection, Exercise Buddy, me or our team is, Amber just said back then when she was teaching, she used visuals, she used structure, and um, those are evidence-based practices. And she embedded it into her class. Um, you did obviously have, I, I'm, which I'm sure is helpful for anyone, right, to have a support staff or a co-teacher. But I think, you know, remember if you're professionals listening, maybe you're going, if you're, an, if you're in Amber's shoes, or soon maybe gonna be in Amber's shoes and challenged with adding exercise, you may not have a co-teacher. But I can guarantee if you're a special education teacher, you're a part of an IEP team. So how do we get to those team members and ask for maybe the visual supports that they may already have, right? Maybe you're connecting with the APE or the general PE teacher to understand a little bit more. Um, so I think, you know, those are extremely helpful strategies and tips. And for most special education teachers listening or families, um, it's really not anything that you're probably too unfamiliar with in regards to structure and visual supports. So, um, so just to recap, Amber, so you said after a reading block or somewhere where you felt that they needed movement is when you and your co-teacher embedded exercise. Mm -hmm. When we would, yep. So two questions. One, what was, what did you see? What were the results of what you saw your students after that reading block? They spent how long in exercise and what did you see the results of that? So after the reading block, we would have, um, depending, we started off with 10 minutes of exercise um, in our lesson plan. And that was great. And as the students, you know, throughout the year, they got in, you know, they got into the routines, into the classroom routines throughout the year. They didn't maybe need that 10 minutes at that time. So if we had the opportunity, we would then break it up right after um, the reading block, five minutes. Mm -hmm. 
if that's all that we could get to, you know, because lessons, you have plans, but they sometimes don't go the way that you expect them to. And so you have to be flexible. So sometimes we would just get to five minutes of exercise after the reading block, but then we knew, okay, there's gonna be another time in our day where they're gonna need exercise. And what we actually found is a lot of times that was right after lunch and recess. Our students got a 30 minute lunch, which involved 15 minutes of eating and 15 minutes of recess. However, they didn't always get their 15 minutes of recess. Um, you know, just transitions would take too long or sometimes they would just be required, be required to actually just sit throughout their recess. So then they weren't getting any movement in their day. And so we knew it was important that these kids are missing out on this physical activity that is so critical to their learning and to their development that we need to then bring it back into the classroom. So then we started doing it um, after lunch and we would, depending on what we thought we, the kids really needed, we would just kind of go off of, you know, how were they transitioning back? We could kind of, um, you know, measure their behavior and their, their level of focus. Sometimes they needed more exercise time. Sometimes they were fine with just five minutes. Got it. I think, again, you said some really important things about, well, one, about, you know, they weren't getting enough physical activity. And again, due to what's happening with COVID-19, due to what's, what we're seeing in the schools, specifically even the state of California, and unfortunately, uh, and maybe other uh, schools and districts and counties are going to follow, but where they're removing physical activity as a mandate. Um, for our kids. And whether they have autism or not, it's so critical to their development. Um, so um, you recognizing that in your team, obviously, kudos to you guys. But again, what you said, and I want people to, to understand is Amber said, be flexible. Look, we know that research now shows that 10 minutes of exercise can reduce some stereotypical behaviors. Many parents, many professionals think, well, our kids have to exercise for 30 minutes or 60 straight minutes. That's not, it, it's very challenging for a neurotypical individual or even myself or anyone to give 30 or 60 minutes a day dedicated to exercise. But if we can start, like Amber said, to like five minutes in your classroom or five minutes after your student or your child gets off the bus, to give them not only the exercise, but that sensory integration that they so desperately need, um, that's what we want. That's the message we're trying to communicate to you guys from, from Exercise Connection, Exercise Buddy and things is we, we want you guys to feel empowered. Um, we want you to understand the benefits of exercise and not only try to teach it to your students or your kids, but quite frankly, you may have to constantly be that advocate at the IEP for your student or talking with administration, which trust me, I realize is more challenging than uh, easier said than done. But this is why exercise is so important because of the benefits that, you know, Amber was seeing at a special education teacher. Yeah, and I just want to add too that, you know, as teachers, we are so pressured with, you know, the instruction that we have to complete, you have to do 60 minutes of math, 45 minutes of writing, right? It's hard to find the time. Maybe, you know, some teachers, it was hard to justify time for 10 minutes of exercise when you have all of these other things that you need to get done. But what we found is that by dedicating those 10 minutes of exercise before learning, it was setting the students up for success for the next instruction to come because otherwise they would just be they would just be then moving in their seats if we didn't give them that structured movement time and you know when they're moving in their seats they're looking around the room they're not getting meaningful learning they're not paying attention to your lesson right 100 percent. i mean i have a three and a half year old neurotypical but he needs to move i mean he's mini me um, but he needs it and, and many of our kids do whether they have autism or not so uh, th their, their body needs it, they crave it. And to your point, they're going to go back to the classroom activities, a fine motor skill or that they're working on, and they're going to be more calm and they're going to be more regulated. And that's the power that exercise has for mm -hmm. our kids with autism and special needs. There's no question. Um, mm -hmm. So we've got 
just so everyone know that's listening, we're going to try to wrap up in about 30 minutes. Uh, we got about another 12 minutes. We're going to try to take some questions uh, before I ask Amber a couple more. Um, and then these will be, this video will be reposted on Facebook. And then we're going to actually post it to Coach Dave to my YouTube channel. So you're going to have opportunities to not only watch again, um, but also share that hopefully with your colleagues, families, anyone, you know, that, that you know that could benefit. We ask that you do. Because again, our message is what we've been advocating and I have for the last 15 years um, about the, the vitality and the importance of exercise for this community. Um, Amber, one, another question I had for you is you had this unique background of working for Exercise Connection as an intern and knowing about obviously the benefits, but your colleagues, not your co-teacher, but were there other teachers, special education teachers in your school that obviously had the same responsibility of teaching exercise, but what were their thoughts? Like, were they scared? Did they not do it? You know, what was the response there? Yeah, so I think for one, a lot of teachers didn't even know it was part of the instructional time allotment because it wasn't given any attention the way that reading and math and writing was given the attention. Um, and I think other teachers, they would incorporate, you know, movement breaks brain breaks throughout their day and throughout their lessons especially with the younger students but um i don't know if it was always structured or used in the most meaningful way where what from our experience you you know you reap the most benefits when it is used in, in a structured meaningful way with students all right so big question <laughs> You get, so your admin tells you, you got to teach exercise for 10 minutes a day for all your students. So you spend this time, you invest this time into it. What was, did admin check in on you? Did they, did they give you a pat in the back? Did they, did, you know, what was the response from admin or wasn't there a response? Tell me about that. You know, it, I don't, I think maybe the first time where it really got attention was during our teacher evaluation because you know we we let our administrators know what we were doing and why it was so beneficial and i think that really you know caught their attention because it was creative it was engaging for the students and we also did it in a way that gave the students ownership of their learning of the exercises they wanted to do you know giving the student that voice and choice and that was I mean, really good for evaluations. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's very insightful um, because again, I, I was never a special education teacher. I was a, I worked at a therapy day school as a fitness uh, coordinator, but my responsibilities because it was a private or my requirements were much different than a public school special education teacher. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, it's very insightful to remember, I think, to other special education teachers listening is look, you may make all these efforts and you may not notice or get any, get any kudos or accolades in the first month or first, excuse me, first two, but when that review comes around and you want to secure your job and you want to show, of, you know, the value that you bring, um, that's a time where you have to go ahead and selfishly, but all for all the right reasons, boast about what you did here. Um, or what you did to in grade exercise and, and the response that it has, because then, well, you know, you get a better review, you, you get a better, you know, you get, you know, work towards your tenure. And um, at the, at the end of the day, it's the most biggest benefits are for your students. Cause now you're going to be challenged, right. With IEP goals of writing, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And we know again, that exercise can help them achieve those, those various goals. Right? Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, before we start taking questions, but um, one, two more maybe. Favorite, give me a, just a quick brief success story of one of your students, uh, something that you just want to share with people. Yeah, so I had a student with uh, autism. And he was a student that, you know, we really struggled with um, 
with workload. He would, uh, he had a very low tolerance for the amount of work that you could give him or the level of difficulty of the work. And, you know, when, when it was just too much for him, he would really escalate and just have a meltdown that could last an hour of him crying, hyperventilating. It was not effective. Um, and so the reason why this is such a success story to me is that because the student initially didn't want to exercise. We tried to introduce yoga as a calming strategy, you know, for when he has these escalations and um, he, he didn't want to do yoga. But fortunately, I had a TA who would be able to sit with that student and I had uh, exercise buddy at the time and she would just play the video models of peers doing yoga. And for whatever reason, that just started to calm him down because the videos were calming. They were calming movements that he was watching. Um, and again, he didn't want to have anything to do with it. But eventually, over time, as we started to make a routine out of this, he eventually accepted that yoga and he would play the videos and he would just sit there, watch the videos, watch the videos. He wouldn't do yoga, but he would watch the videos. And then with a little more time and a little more routine, he started to do the yoga in his chair. And so you really just got to see this progression of someone who resisted exercise as a way to self-regulate, eventually accepting it and taking ownership of those routines and strategies. Yeah, I, just so you guys know, like she never, we didn't talk about this first. So hearing that yeah. again, totally just, there's so many great things from that story. And then and, and the biggest thing, again, that we want you as professionals and parents, parents especially, and professionals maybe to remind parents, is that it's about patience, it's about understanding, and it's about expectation, right? It, it, it may take time for them, but don't mm -hmm. give up. Uh, don't mm -hmm. also give up on those strategies, right? Like Amber did. She said, look, she just had them with with the video model from, and, and he was watching it. And then eventually it turned into the movement. Remember, mm -hmm. it's about establishing that structure. It's reminding these children or this community that, or reminding yourselves that exercises can be a challenge. There's a lot happening. You're asking them to process a, a big gross motor movement, which we know is challenging for many kids, um, to maybe listen to you at the same time, and amongst all the other stuff that's happening in the home, the classroom, or the gym setting, the environment. So we, that's where we want to, and I, and I know Amber too, we want to encourage you to just be patient. Persistence is the goal, not perfection. And um, it can happen. Your children are fully, and your students are fully capable of exercise. But that really battle it comes down to starting with those evidence-based practices. If you don't do that, you're fighting an uphill battle. All right. So, um, Amber, thank you again for joining us. Um, it's a pleasure. If you guys are just kind of catching in at the end, again, Amber, former special education teacher who just shared her knowledge of what she was challenged with as a special ed teacher making exercise a part of her students' classroom activities and their day. Um, we're gonna, again, host these on YouTube uh, or, or replay these on YouTube and on Facebook. But before we go, I, I, Amber, because I can't see it as well, uh, mm -hmm. can you show me and what kind of questions do we have? Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can get in there. I don't see any questions in here. Okay. Doesn't look like we have any questions. One thing that I did want to add, though, that I don't think we got to is, in addition to just structuring the exercise into our daily routines, I do want to add that, you know, we, we, in addition to that structure, we found other ways to use exercise, like I said, as a tool to support our students' needs. We used it for motivation. Um, you know, some students followed a schedule for their work. And in between the activities, they got mini exercise breaks that they got to choose themselves. Um, we would also use it to support transition. 
Um, for example, we had students um, who would maybe come back. Um, in, in the special education class, we had students going to different classes, you know, pushing in, pulling out. So sometimes it was a little chaotic and we would use um, yoga exercises to transition the students back to learning, preparing their minds and their bodies for whole body listening and, you know, just getting ready to refocus on learning. Um, and then obviously, like I said, um, for self-regulation, just regulating behaviors and using exercise to support that. Good stuff. Good reminder for everyone. Um, as we wrap up, just if you have questions, if you, uh, something comes up, just email us. Um, you can email at talk at exercisebuddy.com. Send the comments for us. Talk at exercisebuddy.com. And um, when we have this, if we're on um, the Coach Dave uh, YouTube channel, you can drop your comments there in the discussion and, and I'll be sure excuse me, to respond as soon as I can. Um, but if there's, uh, yeah, we again just encourage and uh, you guys to come. Uh, and lastly, before we sign off with Amber, um, we are gonna have some other guests coming up. Um, two individuals with autism are gonna be joining us that have um, made exercise a part of their routine and, and they're one's, uh, in his third year doctorate degree. Um, another travels across the country. Many of you probably have seen or known him if you've attended autism conferences. Um, and we have some other APE and PE teachers joining us from across the country uh, to provide tips, strategies um, for you both as parents, professionals, whether you're therapeutic, APE, PE, or uh, special education uh, teachers. So. Uh, we look forward to uh, those guests and we thank you guys uh, for joining us. Go ahead, Amber. Were you going to say something? Yeah, it looks like we actually do have one question here. Um, when implementing use of technology during distance learning, one of the greatest challenges has been supporting parents and families to use it from miles away. What would you recommend in terms of supporting and training parents to use Exercise Buddy? Um, what instantly comes to my mind is our, uh, for Exercise Buddy specifically, we do have a series of YouTube tutorials um, that can support how to use Exercise Buddy. Yeah, and if you, Amber, if you can drop that link in the comments. Definitely. So I think the YouTube tutorials help. The, um, we do have in the workout section, there is a whole category dedicated called at-home workouts. And uh, me, Amber, and the team pre-programmed at-home workouts, which is a great baseline to get people started. But uh, whoever, I apologize, I don't know your name, who asked, asked the question. Um, but you can um, pre-program the workouts from your end, you know, knowing what that student or your client needs from whether it's goals or where they're, you know, again, and you can customize that workout, put it on that, uh, that child's profile, and then say, guide mom along virtually. Um, and I hope, you know, that student can follow your client. So um, if you have more questions on that, please email us. Um, and we've had many professionals go through that model of getting that information, not only to the student um, or the workout, but also to the family. Yeah, that was Kristen. Thank you for that question, Kristen. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, well, that is it for now. Um, stay focused on our page and we'll post um, for our next guest um, soon here in the next couple of days. Um, we'll, we'll send out a posting. And uh, again, Amber, thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. We'll talk My first you. Facebook Live, so. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. And everyone have a safe and healthy day and we will talk with you soon.